All right. So next, I want to give you guys a little bit of uh, a little more um, deeper introduction to this technology and that kind of stuff, and tell you a little bit about our history, how we got here, and why we're in this space and th in places that we are with regards to this stuff. Um, so this, for example, is a picture of uh, one of our service learning classes in the Cook Islands. And uh, this was sort of our, our one of our first, uh, sort of our early efforts in using remotely piloted systems. So this guy right here is called a DJI Inspire. It's, this was an Inspire 1. It's up there, broken on the thing because it crashed at, at some point and it's all busted. Um, this thing is, is flying right over your guys' head, over that table. Um, that was a fixed wing we built to map coral reefs. And then this was uh, a uh, sort of DIY, open source, super, super cheap um, uh, underwater ROV uh, that we used to do some stuff and that we, we built for some NGOs in Africa and some, and some other places. Um, uh, and now, now that thing, uh, the, the, the predecessor, uh, not the predecessor, but the, uh, the daughter of that thing is this guy here. So much slicker, much more capable called the Trident um, that clips on to a tether. And then this is a tethered ROV. So it's not, not you know, floating around anywhere in the ocean, but it's connected to the, the boat or the pier or whatever. But a really nice little camera and uh, really useful for education and stuff. Not so much for research, this particular thing, but really great for showing people what the kelp beds look like or what it looks like under the boat in the harbor, something like that. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, uh, this the terminology is, is important. So when we talk about drones, most of the type of drones we're gonna be talking about, as I already mentioned in this course, are these um, uncrewed or unpiloted uh, systems um, they are either remotely controlled, meaning directly remotely controlled by you pushing a, a, a control device, or they're um, being controlled by some type of autopilot routine, an automated control system. Again, the FAA considers what we're talking about between a half pound and 55 pounds because we're the U.S. and we can't possibly use kilograms. We have to, we have to always do this stupid um, old school system. Um, Every year, the use of these commercial or use of drones in different commercial applications is expanding, and it's it's pretty exciting. Um, regulated by the FAA, and most likely pretty, I think it's object. I, I, this is not my opinion. I think it's fairly well regarded that um, we've been completely screwed up by the FAA. So the FAA is a wonderful safety organization, but they were so safety conscious and they're so dominated by old white farts that fly planes, that when this technology started coming up, all that was seen was danger. All that was seen was risk to helicopters. All that was seen was risk to airplanes and that kind of stuff. So therefore, we need to stop it. And so the regulations that we now have inherited, unfortunately, are not about encouraging diverse drone use and appropriate use and everything. So now many other countries, France, uh, other places have much more um, uh, uh, rules and, and, and regulations and, and support structures to encourage a much more diverse drone market. And that's one of the reasons why um, the Chinese builders really took off and why the stuff that was sort of invented here moved to China because we were um, very much about stop, stop, no, 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 no. And it's important to have regulations. I'm not saying we should have a, a free for all, but, but we clamped down so hard that caused issues. Nevertheless, the main rule issuer for us who operate drones is the FAA. Um, a small scattering, and I'm sure you all can think of a gazillion different examples, but, but inspecting utility lines. Several of our students are now employed with different um, consulting firms that essentially all they do is fly around and look for, um, look to see uh, if there's trees near some power lines, like up in the Sierras, et cetera, or, or do inspections to make sure that the transformer isn't about to fail, that kind of stuff around utility lines. Tons and tons of surveying and mapping. You guys will have an opportunity to practice or begin to develop some of your mapping and surveying skills this semester. Um, a lot of stuff in construction. Insane the way this is modernized, modern construction. So this building that we're sitting in, the way it used to be built is you get all these plans, right? And it says, here's the plan for the water system, and here's the plan for the electrical system, and here's the plan for the blah, 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 blah. 
And so it's all drawn up and designed, gets approved, so it's all safe and appropriate and everything. Then it goes to the builder folks. The builder folks go start to build, and they get, they're the electrical builder team. And so they go and do the electrical. And, and I don't know if you guys have worked construction, but sometimes when you say the line is going right towards Jonathan, it goes towards Jonathan. Sometimes it goes towards the window, right? And, and other, other things. So, and sometimes that's because people are stupid. Sometimes it's just because when they get there and start to do it, they realize, oh my gosh, this doesn't, it shouldn't go there. It should actually do this thing. And so what you need at the end of each stage of construction is, are called the as-builts. So not what we thought we wanted to do, but what we actually ended up doing. Historically, that was done very poorly. When, we dr when you drive around your neighborhood and you see all that fluorescent paint on the street that says USA, it's not, it's not rah, rah, America's great. That stands for universal sewer access. And so that's because somebody's doing something to your neighbor's house or the apartment down the street or the shopping center or whatever, and they need to relocate the sewer or the electrical line that's buried. And nobody knows exactly where it is because they don't have these really precise maps. So you hire a consulting firm that has a magnetometer and, and drives around and, and tries to figure out where the pipe is in the ground. And they finally figure it out. And then they take some spray paint and spray paint and say, it's right here. Don't cut, either cut here or don't cut here, depending on what the project is, right? And so that's all because that's, that's stupid. That's lame. That's an incredible waste of time and energy and money and, and paint and everything else. It, we should just know where it is. Well, now with drones, we can. So now what's happened with, with, with large, not so much in people's individual homes, but definitely large-scale commercial projects, like, say, skyscrapers and parking lots and commercial buildings, we go in and we get everything ready start to do it, and every day at the end of, let's say, they're putting rebar down, or they're putting the water lines down, or they're pouring the concrete, right? Before they, they stop, the construction dudes knock off at three o'clock, and then at 3.15, the drone team comes in, and they fly the whole construction site, getting real pictures of where the actual pipe, or the wire, or the whatever the heck is, and they have it exactly. And they fly for an hour or two, whatever it is, finish up. The next day, the guys come in. Maybe they pour concrete and they bury that. Cool. Now they do the next level. Then you fly the next day. So we, we build these highly, highly precise, way better than we've ever had, so that when there is an electrical fire or a sewage line crack or something in that building, instead of having to hire someone that they thud around for an hour trying to find the pipes, you know exactly where the pipes are. So that's one example of how it's really, really not just sort of improved, but taken construction to a, a massively better level, much more efficient, much more safe and all that kind of stuff. Uh, architecture, all kinds of GIS, archaeology, marine bio. We use, we use these things in Hawaii to monitor the whales. Um, search and rescue, a very, very popular use for this technology. And one of the first uses of this technology is to find missing hikers and, and people like that. Um, of course, tons and tons of stuff with cinema now. Um, uh, journalism, so, so sometimes I get calls for journalists that want me to look at stuff, like an oil spill, so they can't go onto the property. Um, it's private property, but they could fly a drone up and look over the wall, but they maybe need somebody that knows about oil spills, like, is this really an oil spill? What am I seeing? So, you know, that's not spying, but it just gives them, can, can open up different perspectives for that kind of stuff. Um, uh, medical transport is becoming a really big thing. Package delivery, which we always hear about, and it's always about to start, but, but probably getting closer. So all these things are um, becoming more and more. The basic stuff, again, more on this as we, as we go through the semester, but, but the core stuff that we'll just start with so you have in the back of your head, um, our typical use is um, 400 feet, okay? And so um, 400 feet, and that AGL stands for above ground level. So that's not 400 feet relative to sea level, it's relative to whatever is around us. So if I'm right here on campus and I fly, I can only go 400 feet, right? And we're maybe like, what are we right here? Like 20 feet above sea level or something like that, right? So, so let's call it 420 feet would be the max. However, if we go up the hill into Thousand Oaks, since that's more like 500 feet above sea level, we can still keeping that 400 foot barrier from or, or, or lens from the ground, we could be potentially something like 900 feet above sea level, right? So, and if I'm flying right here and there's a tower, I mean, generally we'd avoid the tower, but let's say 
for some, whatever reason we had to go over the tower, I can actually fly over the tower and the tower, the tip of the tower becomes the bottom of the 400 feet. So it's above whatever the surface is that we're flying. That, why 400 feet? Anybody want to guess as to why 400 feet? Oh, very close. 500 feet. So helicopters are not supposed to, unless they're take, taking off and landing, they're not supposed to be less than 500 feet. So the idea there is, we, theoretically, if everybody's following the rules, you always have a 100-foot buffer. So if something goes wrong, if the altitude sensor was screwed, you still have some safety, margin of safety. So yes, it's, it's, it's based off of what the aircraft around us might be doing. They can go much, much higher, right? But, but that, that's for us, our, our general rules. And the other one, the other general rule is line of sight, meaning that we always can see the, the platform. I mean, it gets cloudy day, a white thing on a white cloud. I mean, can I really see it? But basically, what is, well, in practice that means it's about a mile or so, you know, ish. I mean, it gets, again, it's gonna depend on the weather and the local, but, but something like that. That thing, the, the, the fixed wing that we built, we can fly that 14 miles away. Because um, in the Cook Islands, they don't have the restrictions. And so the transmitter we had on that was much more powerful. So we could also fly that same thing here out essentially almost to the Channel Islands and back, but that would be violating our, our, what we're supposed to do. In fact, when this started happening, um, or when this started breaking out, mm, let's call it uh, 2014 or so, something like that, that's what a bunch of these hobbyists were doing. They were just, hey, I wonder if we could do this. So they would go down to the beach in Ventura and they would put these really big transmitters and they would fly out to Santa Cruz with one of these little, uh, you know, uh, fixed wings and then turn around and come back and uh, usually come back. Sometimes they wouldn't come back. Um, and then when people found that out, they got really ticked and that really started to get people to pay attention around here to to what was going on. Um, generally, and you can fly over you, you can fly over me, you can fly over our team, but generally we don't, and if occasional hiker is out there, it's not a problem, but we generally don't fly over people, right? So in particular, we definitely don't fly over large crowds of people. We don't fly over people at the Super Bowl or at Santa Monica, you know, Third Street Promenade or something like that, right? Um, uh, there, you can get permission to go, like if the Olympics, or the Olympics coming back, right? I guarantee there'll be drones over there. So you can get a permit, but that's a special thing. As default, we, we, we don't want to fly over people. Um, and then similar, similar to that um, is a night operation. So, so by default, we don't fly at night. You can, again, you, it's another permit you can ask for for the FAA. And if you have reason to, you can get it. It's not a, not a big deal, but, but by default, we don't. Um, and then uh, the other big one is, is proximate to airports. So a lot of what you guys will see and read in the next uh, couple weeks in, in, our, in our book is, um, is are, are the rules around that airspace. Is, you know, what, what, what size airport is it? What, you know, there's all these various things. But suffice it to say, um, getting close to airports, we want to be particularly careful. Um, obviously, that's because the vehicle, those, those helicopters or, or airplanes, even though they might cruise at 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet or wherever they're doing, they have to land, right? And in particular, that landing and takeoff, those are some of the hardest times for pilots, right? Because they have to be you know, either like say throttling down or they have to be controlling things slightly different. And, and so we in particular wanna make sure we're not getting in the, the, the takeoff or landing flight paths of these uh, folks. Um, and that's a real issue for us because a lot of our sites, like in Goleta that we monitor beaches, is right in the flight, pa flight path of um, uh, Santa Barbara Airport. Um, and uh, other sites up at Vandenberg. And, and, and so it turns out for the kind of work that we do in the coastal zone, this is a, a really big issue. Essentially what you need to do is, is you need to sort of either reach out through your controlling app or reach out to, we, back in the day we used to have to call the tower and talk to folks. Um, so it is possible, but again, by default, the default rules, we don't want to be near airports. Um, uh, uh, again, we want people to be safe and, and have the appropriate certifications. For, for most of what we're talking about here, that's part 107. Again, as I mentioned before, if you're a hobbyist, they would also like, the FAA would like to see you have your trust, have, have done the trust uh, certificate. Um, as I mentioned, DJI controls the vast, you know, DJI is the 
400 pound gorilla in this, in this world. Um, uh, the consumer market is dominated by recreational users. So hobbyists, people want to take pictures of themselves surfing or get a cool picture of the sunset, uh, make a family you know, wedding anniversary video, that kind of stuff. Um, you can buy them pretty much anywhere. Um, there are other manufacturers that are, that are um, doing better each day um, because of these constraints with um, DJI. But again, they're still the biggest player. Um, DJI really also is strong in the commercial industry as well. So whereas some, some, some manufacturers only serve the sort of recreational hobbyists, DJI does, has a professional services, the professional industry as well as the sort of occasional user. Um, and, and when we talk about commercial stuff, we're generally talking about things that are much more. So this stuff, you know, depends on what we're talking about. We're talking, you know, anywhere from 500 bucks for a real crappy thing to about a thousand bucks to um, maybe 2000 bucks ish. You know, that's sort of somewhere in that vague range. This stuff, very expensive. So our EB, um, which is our fixed wing, that guy's 35,000. Um, uh, uh, if we've been trying to get a, a a LiDAR based unit and the cheap one we're trying to get is about $40,000. The really nice ones are like $100,000, $150,000. So these things can get expensive fairly quickly in this commercial space um, because of the added capacity, because of all the additional control architectures and stuff. And so for example, um, these guys are much bigger. So, these, so the, the, these guys are a much larger unit that can carry a, a regular, um, D, um, a regular uh, SLR camera type of thing. Um, uh, this guy right here is a LiDAR unit. This guy here is an infrared thermal unit. And so those things all get um, expensive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our history, what we've been doing on, on our campus and, and how we play into this story. And so if you fall asleep now and you're like, oh my God, it's the light in the day on Friday, it's time to go. Um, uh, I would just say that um, we st when we began this, we were at a unique point in time, we still are in the history of this technology. This is still an exciting time for you all to get, um, potentially get involved with this stuff. Stuff is really changing um, almost by the month still in terms of new innovations and stuff. So that's really, really cool. Um, and all the stuff in the back wall and other places, this was, um, especially before the pandemic, this was really a big maker space. We kind of lost some of that. I hope we, I hope um, you guys are interested in, in this kind of stuff and are interested in maybe playing with the laser cutter and playing with a 3D printer and starting to mess around again. And what we had before the pandemic is we'd have any random day where there wasn't a class in, in our lab here, we'd have three, four, five, six students in here working on different stuff, underwater drones, flying drones, something to help monitor some microplastics, something like that. And, and again, because of we were all distanced for so long, we sort of lost the tradition and the tradition was really the kids that knew nothing would come on in they go, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. And then they get help from the person that was, knew a little bit. And the person that knew a little bit would get help from the more advanced students. And it was awesome. Everybody was helping everybody out. Everybody was helping everybody on the projects. It was really cool. Love to get back to that. But that was really key to how we got involved with all these drone things. And the general term that we've used for this is concert. So mechatronics is where we take mechanical things with electronic control architecture, right? We have a mechatronics major here on campus, for example. Um, and we call what we do conservation mechatronics. So it's that stuff, but it's applied to sustainability, environmental justice, uh, monitoring water and air and critters and that kind of stuff. And we've used them all over the place. So a couple examples of some of this stuff. So those are all drones. Uh, that program was partially run by one of our old former students, um, who now is his own company. Um, we see these things everywhere now. This is up in the Sierras. Look at that same behavior. <laughs> so this guy just pulled out his little pocket DJI thing and was flying around taking, taking pictures of stuff as a friend of mine who's a fire captain in LA. Um, uh, they're everywhere. So um, this remote ID, right, supposed to, you know, it just causes so, I can't tell you how much, uh, uh, cha how challenging it's been to try to get all, follow the rules and get everything all legal and get everything, you know, all this remote ID. Um, it's supposed to work, right? The gentleman that tried to kill um, former President Trump uh, pulled out his DJI drone 
and reconnoitered the site the day before he tried, before he tried to, before he did kill those people. Um, and, uh, and theoretically, that shouldn't have been allowed, or at least the Secret Service should have seen him. Nobody saw him, right? Uh, and so, so this remote ID has a lot of holes in it, um, but that's going on. Um, if you guys watch the Olympics, one of the Canadian coaches for soccer got busted by taking a drone and going and flying over one of the other uh, uh, team's practices and was like, oh, how are they kicking the ball right there, right? So, so got canned. So this stuff is in the, in the news just all the time, all the time. So in the context of, and we hear a lot about, um, unfortunately, the, the use of these devices for violence and, and war and that kind of stuff. Um, but this is, there's a, interesting stories that, that have begun to come out of, of how, because we've cracked down uh, on Russia because of their invasion of a sovereign nation and try to squeeze them economically, this has really pushed um, people to go to uh, places that um, don't necessarily follow the democratic rule of law, like especially Iran, um, uh, Venezuela, and uh, China, and that's where the new pipeline has come. And so if we look at the drone, this is, this is the, um, uh, Russia's purchasing of drones, um, and this is in the context of the uh, Ukrainian war, um, we see this huge spike and then it kind of crashes um, because Russia finally was able to figure out how to circumvent all these things and get the parts that they want from Russia. So up here, they were mostly buying intact drones on the upper figure and whole units they would just take and use. Again, these things that are all around the lab is literally what they were using. So this is not some, I mean, there are specialized military drones, but they're using off the shelf stuff. They're using literally stuff from Best Buy and that kind of stuff. And indeed, initially in the first phases of the Ukrainian war, when you, the Ukrainian army was looking for stuff, one of the major ways people were doing, it was literally going in LA, in Washington DC, in Nebraska, and going to the DJI store and buy, or going to Best Buy, buying all the DJI stuff that you would fly on the weekend and just put them in a package and send them, you know, overseas. Um, and so, so that was the first little bit. And then that, that sort of got exhausted. And so we see down here, these are the purchasing of parts. So now Russia is primarily building their own drones from the assembled parts and then using those as essentially suicide bombers and stuff like that. Ukraine doing the same thing. So Ukraine has spun up a whole new industry um, to supply their own people, their own forces with drones. And this is just getting crazier and crazier by the day. So this is an article on, on the industry. And I don't remember how many, like 75 different businesses have spun up specifically inside Ukraine to support um, the Ukrainian side of the battle. Um, all kinds of, because they're becoming so ubiquitous, now we're talking about some of our um, uh, ships, like regular commercial shipping, starting to have anti-drone technologies on them when they traverse places like the Red Sea or other, other locations like that. There's currently a, an oil tanker burning about 75 miles west of the, the capital, the main port in Yemen, um, attacked by the Houthi rebels, and it's on fire and leaking oil. Um, and and so, so these things, the, the use of drones and the use of uh, drone and anti-drone technology is becoming a, a big story. Um, and this is just, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hype on this stuff, but this just shows how easy it is to do this stuff. So this is, so I don't want to show anything more, but, um, but so this is, so these things are ubiquitous, right? And, and anybody, virtually anybody can build these things. In some cases, people are taking the devices and using them for violence. In other cases, they're taking the devices and using them to deliver violence, like drop a, a hand grenade or something like that. And the technology is all off the shelf. So with all the stuff in the back there, so that 3D printer is a couple thousand bucks. Um, and then the, these, these units, which are a couple thousand bucks, it, it, it's, it's crazy how these things are changing everything. Now, that was violence and war. You can do the same thing for drug delivery. You can do the same thing for bringing, um, uh, 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 you know, micro dosing pesticides. So instead of blanketing the whole field, maybe we could micro dose where we only have problems. So it re they really have opened a tremendous um, uh, opportunity and, and diversity of, 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 of capacities that we can do. Okay. So uh, we generally have referred to these things as remotely piloted systems because 
we do both in the air, in the water. We're primarily going to do air in this class. Um, I hadn't really planned on doing much with the, the water stuff, but originally this class was designed to be either run as an underwater um, a robot training or in the air robot training. And so we use the term remotely piloted systems that, that sort of generically cover all those things. And so this is an example. This guy's over in our storage cage. This is, this is from the 90s, this yellow guy. This is a big, um, a larger thing, which looks super James Bondy and super impressive and super cool. Um, it does nothing different than this. It just has a longer tether. But because back in the 90s, it was harder to build this, all of this stuff is all the control stuff and the camera's a little teeny thing up front. So this is almost as, a, I mean, that, that has stronger thrusters, but, but this is pretty darn uh, similar to this, the capacity. Um, yeah, and so that guy was built to be able to go through um, uh, the security checkpoint at, um, at LAX. So the whole thing disassembles. So you can pull off the pipes and everything, and it goes in one little container that will fit in a, in a, um, uh, in a, a checked bag so that we can disassemble the whole thing and then reassemble the whole thing wherever we needed to go. But back in the day, that's how we made our drones, right? So, you know, 10 years ago in this lab, we did all of our stuff by, um, by doing it ourselves, getting parts, going forward, doing it. And it was great, but that took like six months to build. It's very simple, but we'd fly it and then it would crash. And we're like, oh, it's wrong. And then we'd like fix it for like a week. Okay, okay, and then we think we fix it. And then we try it again and, like, yeah, and it crashed. And so there's a tremendous amount of trial and error. Very fun for you guys. It wasn't exciting for me because I'm like, I want this thing to work. Um, pretty much now we don't build our own raw stuff anymore just because the, commer the commercially available stuff is so good and it's so cheap. So usually what we do is we, we just use the regular off the shelf stuff or we tweak them. So we use those things to build a gimbal, to build a thing to hold a, uh, a sampling device or to hold a camera. But we're not building stuff from scratch anymore just because that's not our jam. So we're not, we're not an engineering program. We are an environmental science program, right? We're about like, let's solve some problems, let's collect some data. And so the building was fun, but that was sort of not really our point. We're agnostic with this technology, and I would encourage you all to be agnostic. If this thing is cool this year, if this is doing my thing, awesome, I'm gonna do this for my task, collecting my data, doing my monitoring, whatever. And if, you know, six months from now, there's a better product or a cheaper product, whatever, go ahead and use that cheaper product. Don't, get, don't be wedded to one particular technology just because you're used to it. Um, Okay, um, yeah, I'll just say uh, it is true that a lot of this stuff um, comes from the military, right? So it comes from military investments, long-term investments in, in people wanting to do harm to other people, um, but that need not be the future of this technology. Of course, that'll probably stay as we're seeing with these wars around the world that it's very popular. We love to slaughter each other, but, um, but uh, it is true this stuff is birthed in military stuff. And when I get to the story about how we started to use this stuff, that was one of the big concerns people had. Well, this was funded by the military. We shouldn't be involved in the military. I'm like, I'm not the military. We're not trying to do stuff. I'm like, well, then we shouldn't ever touch it. Um, I would posit to you that that's sort of a naive view because our computers came from the military. The GPS came from the military. Um, it, it's sort of like, if we, if we, have, if we take that rule, um, we would be not using much of the technology that we have at our fingertips. Um, but to, at the same time, it's important to acknowledge that. Acknowledge that's, that's some of the heritage is there. Um, um, we also sometimes use the term robots to talk about these things. So a robot is a machine that can carry out a, a complex set of tasks without you having to you know, make it do every single step yourself. Um, uh, either with no human control or just minimal human control. Um, and so it's, it's, a robot is different from a remotely piloted system, but in most general terminology, in most general senses, they're not. In the general public, they, they don't see these types of distinctions. Um, but there's other terms, just, so we mentioned, already mentioned, uh, uh, un, originally called unmanned, now unpiloted or uncrewed, uh, aerial vehicles or aerial systems. Um, and a lot of times in the lingo, again, you'll just see the term UAV. 
or UAS. And so you, you'll need to know what that means. Um, you'll sometimes hear the term roto wing, rotor wing for, um, for uh, things like that sort of behave like a helicopter, and then, and then fixed wing for things that behave like a, an airplane, and VTOL, we already mentioned vertical takeoff and landing. That's in the, in the flying. In the stuff that touches the water, um, uh, uh, USV for um, surface vehicle, that would be something that's on like the, the skin of the water. Um, sometimes autonomous surface vehicle, and then remotely operated vehicle would be like what this guy is, right? So these little, these little um, guys that are typically an ROV is tethered um, to the surface. So you, you, you sort of have maintained power from, from the surface and control from the surface. And then the big, the big area is uh, AUV, so autonomous underwater vehicles. So this, this thing just without the tether. Right, so this thing that can now have enough battery power, et cetera, um, to go on its own and, and, and do potentially for months and months on end. So we have things now going across the Pacific and, and monitoring different areas of the world. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Multi-rotor is also a common term we might, I might sometimes say or might use. Um, and that just means more than, more than a helicopter. So a helicopter is technically one propeller. Um, so multi-rotor is more than one, and the quadcopters are the most common. Um, or, or some of these people just say quad. FAA, you guys should know about. And then again, aircraft is any flying object capable of changing course while in transit. Okay. So let's look at a couple of these things. So this is the sort of um, the mother that really got the modern drone industry going. This is a Phantom. Uh, and this is like, so when you see a picture of a drone, this is mostly what people use, like, or to illustrate, you know, they'll use this guy. So this is a Phantom um, from DJI. Um, fantastic tool. We still have these. We still may use some of these. Really, really solid. Very hard to F this thing up. Um, I mean, th these things are super robust. Built into it, the landing, uh, the landing gear, it's not gear, but, but the, the, the things you land on are fixed. So it doesn't retract or whatever. So the, the, it makes a protective basket around the camera so that even if something all goes wrong, the camera can never just bounce on the ground. Whereas many of our other ones, if something goes wrong, the camera could you know, smack the ground or whatever. And, just, and this is one of ours. So you can see it's all, the props are all dirty. Some, somebody ran into some grass or something. And this sucker just would keep on going. These were, these were uh, wonderfully uh, solid machines. And this was really the first one that put it at the price point where, every, where random Joe Blow people could get it, right? You didn't have to spend $10,000 or something like here. And, and the control architecture had come along that this could self-stabilize. That was the key thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the manufacturer is, D, so the picture is upside down, but, but it's D, yeah, DJI is the, is the manufacturer. The model is a phantom, or the, excuse me, the, um, yeah, the make is, no, the model is a phantom. And this was probably a phantom two or three. Um, yeah. So they don't make these anymore. So they've now moved on to other models, but these were, these were the workhorse. So but the price point, the incredible performance, and the really fantastic stabilization. So before this, it was very hard to get something that would stabilize. Um, I'll come back to that when I talk about the history of this class and how we, how we did stuff. Um, so then another huge thing that moved things forward was this guy. So this is, in, this is also DJI, this is an Inspire. And whereas this guy had a camera, this camera was sort of analogous to a GoPro camera. Uh, now, let me also say that um, there's sort of two flavors of cameras here, or two flavors of sensors. Let me say that, two flavors of sensors. One is to help you as the pilot. Like, hey, am, am I getting near a building? Or let me see what it looks like, right? And so that's to help you navigate, either, either you providing input or help it to autonomously navigate. Then there's the sensors that we're actually going to use to collect data. Those could be infrared, those could be multispectral, those could be laser beams to do distance, they could be anything. So in this case, this thing is serving both purposes. So this sensor here is both the thing that, that the pilot can look through or see, as well as the sensor that's going to be uh, uh, the, the way to collect data. Um, now it's more common to have sort of 
multiple sensors and have, have you know, say the navigation camera and then separately the data collection camera. Um, uh, this camera spins independently, so this camera can, so, so this guy, the, the body might be floating here, either moving or stationary, and then with this holding in, you know, not the, the, the main vessel not moving, the camera can look down and turn and look in diff different ways. But right here, because we have this great protective cage, which is one of the reasons it was so robust and so awesome, what it meant was if I was looking at, if I was looking at you guys, I was looking at Austin, and then I kind of started to turn. At some point, I'm going to hit this television, right? At some point, I'm going to see this white, the white line of the cage here. And so, you know, for us, that wasn't that big a deal. You, you can also, then I can just turn my body. I can just make, I can also have the, the, the camera be fixed, and I can just move, move my frame, so that wouldn't happen. But, because that sometimes could happen, um, this was the next big innovation. So this is the DJI Inspire. And so for this guy, and you can see with this busted dude up here, let me grab him. And when we first got this guy, this was our first big expense. This is our first big, I mean, this was like, oh my God, this costs like, I forget, like $4,000. Like, oh my God, nobody can touch it, you're gonna break it. So, so this guy, which is all, this, this guy's dead, but you can see, so this guy would start, and this is now what most of our drones do. So he starts, and there's a, a sort of landing gear is down, and he's in one position. And then after he launches, then he kind of gull wings, right? He kind of raptor wings, and, it, and the arms articulate up above the aircraft, so that now the camera has a full 360. So even if, I'm, if I have the platform not moving, just by spinning the camera, I can see 360. So these became instantly massively popular in, in Hollywood with all these sort of you know, TV commercial filmers and, and people doing like fashion shoots and stuff like that. Cause it was, oh, it was great. And, and a very, 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 very high quality camera. Much better than like a, a typical GoPro. And so this was, these guys were awesome. And I have, I have stories I can tell you about all these things, how they all went awry. One of them is, and I've told maybe some of you guys a story. So um, when we, we had this in the Cook Islands. In the Cook Islands, we didn't have cars to get around. So we just had mopeds. And the students loved it. So they were driving on mopeds. And so as hot tropics, and we were monitoring reefs and things. And so one of my students, the guy that for a while worked for the IBM drone swarm people, um, I was like, hey, I'm just gonna go around uh, and, and I'll just, instead of packing everything up and we have like big cases that are heavy and stuff, but he's on a little moped. So he took this and he put it, put some straps on it and he made a backpack with it like this. And so, you know, driving around. And it was the early days. And so um, the, I have all kinds of stories from, from that trip, but, um, but in the, this case, um, he started driving. And he thought to be easy, this is where the battery goes in the unit. He had the battery locked in here just so we wouldn't have to have another thing carried, right? It's turned off. And you guys will go through all this later, but, but you know, it was depowered. So he just was, was carrying it. But the software, unbeknownst to us, had this technology in it in case the battery died or something went weird and it started to crash. So they, they, it was getting so sophisticated so fast, it was awesome. And so the idea is if this guy is up in the air and something goes wrong, maybe there's, there's an electrical fart or a fault or a problem or whatever, and it starts to fall, right? It, uh, they worked out the physics that as it's, so, so there's four guys spinning here that are gonna create lift. And then based on how fast we spin those at different rates, that'll allow me to kind of tilt forward or tilt back or turn. That's how we turn and do all that kind of stuff, all from changing the power going to each of these different spinning uh, propellers. Uh, well, they figured out that there's a very clear signal that if this is falling, that's normally how it moves. It moves this way, goes this way, goes to cha-cha, goes up here, goes down there. But when it tumbles like this, it, it like sometimes this propeller moves like really fast and this one doesn't move it, it, it sort of they figured it out so as my student was driving <laughs> driving with this on his back apparently this thing thought it was falling through the air and so it said i gotta stop myself and so unbeknownst to us it can it could turn itself on so as it's on his back it all of a sudden <laughs> it's like, he's like what and these blades are each about a foot long they're really dangerous 
And so this thing is like a Swiss, you know, Cuisinart on his back. Like, and he's like, ah! and he's like, how do I get this thing off? And so, um, so we've done everything wrong probably you guys can do with this without, without seriously harming someone. So, so um, these things evolve. They keep evolving. Uh, and then this thing came along, and this was revolutionary to us. So this guy's also up there. So we have the, the old head from what would become the Mardi Gras Indians. That, that, it's an African tradition um, of ghost dancers and stuff, but it's on a, um, that blue thing is this guy. So this is 3DR. 3DR was super expensive. They liked, uh, super expensive, super awesome. They were so great, they gave us $10,000 of broken things one time that we still have them. They're awesome. We've used them to build solar sailors, all kinds of great stuff. So 3DR, while DJI is like Apple, 3DR is like Linux. So this was started by a guy who was the original editor for Wired magazine. He started building these in California. And then when it got expensive, he started building them in California and in Tijuana. And then eventually he just couldn't keep up with the, with the Chinese um, the economics of the electronics industry. But it was, this is all open source. So not only was this a great, you know, super solid drone, um, but we could get in and we could program it to do stuff that we want to do for bird monitoring or whatever. So they were really, really great. And it's all open architecture. So we actually use GoPro cameras so we could put all these kinds of things on. Whereas this was this really awesome, cool thing that everything fits exactly together. And if you don't have the right part, it won't work. This is more like a Lego block. And it was great. So this was really, really helpful. So um, our first large investment for teaching units for you guys were these 3DR, which stands for 3D Robotics, 3D Robotics units, which were really, really cool. Unfortunately, the company no longer exists. And then things just really, really uh, went crazy. Um, so people started making these really high-end, you know, hex and octorotors. We were building our own stuff. And then we also started to see the proliferation of smaller units of like more toy-like um, devices that even though they're toys, they were pulling in some of the command architecture from some of the DJI types of stuff. So they were much more stable to, to fly. Um, this is the arrow that we built. Um, uh, this is um, an example of a company in um, uh, Simi Valley. So this is AeroVironment. And they've, they've actually given us one, our VTOL comes from them. So they, they were generous enough and gave us a VTOL. But this is called a Puma. So this is originally developed for the military. Now is widely used by NOAA. And we have an MOU with NOAA to, to do data sharing and stuff with them. And so NOAA, that uh, most importantly for us, they're the manager of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. The Park Service manages the land, but the sanctuary around the islands. And so they use the, so this is essentially, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a video with you guys so you can see it. Um, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say something because I'm recording this and I'll share this with you guys. But, but, but we did some cool stuff. Anyway, um, so, so this guy though, which is used originally to do like track bad guys and stuff like that, right? Um, we now can use that to track, um, uh, you know, illegal pongas, so, so drug traffickers. You can use it to monitor whales. And it's so good, you can, you can point the camera at like Max and then it'll just stay on her. And so even though the thing might be you know, floating around and we launch it like this, you and you throw it into the air. And then this guy lands in the ocean, it lands in the water. So all the batteries here, everything's all sealed and designed that it's okay to get in contact with salt water. And it, and it like kind of and crashes in the water and then you scoop it out with a, with a pole and then keep going. Um, so that's an example of, of sort of this very clearly military things that just our federal partners just essentially borrowed. And essentially they just took out some of the, the super secret um, uh, like radio communication parts of it. But all the other parts is like what, what they would have used on the battlefield kind of thing. Um, then we see a, a whole proliferation of, and which is happening now, all kinds of really interesting companies. In this case, this is, a, this is not a, a flying, this is, a, this is a, on the surface of the ocean, but this is a cool guy that will, when it's windy, will pop up a, a sail and sail around. When it gets to, um, when there isn't wind or whatever, it has solar on there. Um, this guy will, will uh, drive itself around the ocean. This guy is a, essentially a solar powered surfboard. Um, this or a version just like it, actually, uh, in about 2015, 2016, actually, and there's a, some thrusters underneath here to help it move. Um, we built a small one that we 
we're using in the Channel Islands Harbor. Um, but this one or one like this went from California to Hawaii and back on its own. So really cool. Um, and then we have things that are using wave energy. So rather than having batteries and just stored power, it's constantly getting new, um, new uh, energy from the up and downness of the waves. And then this is an inspection guy. This is like a more research vessel, all this kind of stuff. This is, a, this is an autonomous underwater vehicle um, and they do all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, so one of the reasons why this stuff has gotten so good and the reason why we had this explosion starting about a decade ago was our, is our cell phones. So the invention of the cell phone, in particular the invention of the iPhone in 2007, um, led to a massive improvement in terms of economies of scale, efficiencies, et cetera. A couple things. So one was the, let's see, which one do I want to talk about first? Yeah, okay, so one is just the, the, the cheapness of computer processors. So this is processor time uh, as we go you know, back in the day. It's, just, it's continuing to fall. So, for, so it's getting more and more possible to spend the same amount of money and get way more processing. So that means you can do much more complicated stuff inside of these, uh, of these guys. Um, it's still having about every year. Okay, the next is people, like all you youngins, like to play your Minecrafts and all your things, you kids, right? And so that involves taking my phone and turning my phone a little teeny bit. So we got really, really good at very, very, very precise sensors that could detect movement. So a little teeny shift. If I, you know, I turn my phone this way or this way. Um, and so that, um, that uh, 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 sensing where you are in space, with the processor speed, with the really, really, really low power drain. So also when we started doing these cell phones, um, people had to figure out how to do these electronic circuits and stuff with barely sipping any electricity. So that made them much more efficient. So all these things coming out of the cell phone world got directly imported into these drones and allowed us to do something that would have required like a big giant military airplane before. Now we could do it in something the size of what's on the table here. Um, and then all this other stuff in our place here at CSUCI, our 3D printers, all the stuff here, um, uh, all this jazz was really, has really been um, uh, key. And also our unique geography here, our place, we'll end in a minute here, we'll, 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 we'll pick this up next week, but, but I just want to end on saying our, our place was fundamental to how we started to use drones. And because our policies have become the standard policies for this at CSU, how a lot of the place works. So. Um, uh, we tolerate a lot of new thinking here. We try a lot of new things, right? We have our boating safety class. We have a drone class. We have, you know, all these things that we try piloting. Um, and and we're, we're interested in that. Um, we have a lot of stuff that we needed to build. We still need to build. But, you know, 10 years ago, we, we really needed to build a lot of stuff. Um, we, you guys are awesome. So I gave a talk at a university I will not name. And I put up probably the same slide. And I said, one of our strengths, one of the reasons we're doing drones is because we have a diverse group of students. And this professor said, okay, I got the speed of the processor and I, you know, da 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 But I don't get the diverse students. Like, what's the diverse thing about? And I said, oh, well, that means we have people from all different backgrounds and different life experiences and different skill levels and all that stuff. And it's great to have all those folks in our lab. And he was like, uh, why? And, and so we went back and forth a couple times. Long story short, he wasn't trying to be an asshole, um, but he was an engine. This was at a big engineering university. So he was an engineering professor. So for his perspective, he was interested in making this thing. He wanted to just make this and he wanted to make for example, really good propellers. So for him, he needed somebody that really knew the math of the propeller and really knew the, the chemistry of how to make the plastic and you know, that kind of stuff, right? So for him, it, diversity wasn't really important. What he wanted was really, really strong skill X or skill Y, and that was it. That ain't us, right? So we, want, we don't really care about these devices. These are just a means to an end, right? We want the data from this. We want to understand where the land might be slipping and we have to get these people out of harm's way or where we should protect the turtle nests or whatever it is, right? And so because our interest is in using this technology, hopefully using it for good, 
having our student body, having you all that have diverse perspectives, diverse everything, is a strength. But this guy couldn't understand it because that wasn't his world. That wasn't, like, he, all he thought about all day long was propeller, 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 and the computer program that said, what kind of, how to modify propeller. And so that's not us. And so, um, uh, we benefit, we, our program has benefited from all of you guys and, and, and trying to engage all of you guys in addition to everything else. Um, the interdisciplinarity really, really helps, especially this stuff in the early days. Um, we're, again, we're applied, so we're not trying to do one thing. We're trying to do, solve a lot of problems. That's really helped. Because of our field orientation, that's really helped. Um, we have a, our service learning uh, focus, which has also been really good. And then um, we'll just wrap up with the last couple slides here. So, so um, we started getting invited to all these different things. So this was a NASA exhibit. Or this is a, a, a thing for NASA. And I was like, uh, no, maybe you have us wrong. We're, we do like environmental science stuff. Like, oh yeah, yeah, we want you guys to come. And we're like, uh, wait, we don't do NASA stuff? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So um, especially early on, there were very few folks doing stuff and, they, and, and people really liked us. Another last, and then maybe we'll we end this one or the next slide. Uh, yeah, we'll end. Well, and maybe here. Okay, so another thing, which we'll, we'll pick up next week when we continue on our history part two. Um, Scary Dairy, probably most of you guys recognize Scary Dairy out at Camp Park. This is not where we will routinely be flying. We'll be flying near here, but not in here. This was the original site where we kept hay and uh, some cows and things like that back when the mental hospital that was here before our university was here, um, when they... Initially, they grew a lot of their own food, right? They had their dairy operations, they had chickens, they had that kind of stuff out at Camp Park. And Camp Park was the, the farm area of campus. And so they had this, this great old barn, a great old hay barn, like three, four stories tall. It's awesome. It's super solid. It's hard to knock down. <laughs> I think the administration wanted to knock it down several times, but they're like, it's too hard to knock down. So they left it. And um, so I'll just say that uh, we'll pick the story up next time, but I'll wet your whistle by saying what happened initially was at one point they said, nobody can fly drones, period. And we're like, why can't we fly drones? You can't fly drones. And then we said, we can't fly drones ever? Well, you can't fly drones in U.S. airspace. And th this wasn't to us. This was the whole country, right? Um, and so we're like, okay, but we can, I said, but we can fly indoors, right? And they're like, what? I said, we can fly indoors, right? And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. And so one of the reasons we have these tables in this lab right here is so that we can shove the labs, these tables off to the side and we could do, so initially with our little teeny tiny like toy ones, I'd have everybody practice with those. Um, but then when we weren't allowed to go outside, we would go fly here. So technically, this is not outside. Right? There's a roof overhead. Even though there's basically the wind, it's just like being outside because the wind is windy and the sun is in your eyes. But technically, technically we weren't outside. So for that, that year or year and a half when everybody and their brother was, was grounded, we were still able to train you guys. We were still able to use our unique infrastructure, our unique sense of place. And so, um, so we'll continue on this, but I'll just, I'll just say that... that um, one of the reasons we are, have become as proficient as we are with these drones and all these robotics and stuff um, is because of our place, because of you, and because of our interest in trying to solve problems. And if you maintain that spirit, that, that thinking about this technology that way, I think you'll be great. If you start to think it's, it's the end all be all of everything, then you start to get trapped into thinking this is, this is the only way to do things or this is the best way or whatever. Um, stay hungry, stay agnostic, and, and we'll, you can get to good places. So we'll continue the story next week.